You know, I mean, I think, look, you can't, I think, have a conversation about this topic without talking about the fact that there are too many um, AR-15s and assault weapons of variety that are out on the streets today in the United States. You know, as somebody who believes that those kinds of weapons should be restricted to the military and law enforcement, I hope that part of what comes out of this tragic really tragic event is a conversation about restricting the access um, of civilians to these kinds of weapons. There's just no reason for it. And as you can see, and we've seen over and over and over and over again, with virtually every mass shooting, for sure, the weapon of choice is an AR-15-like gun yeah. that fires Multiple shots can be rigged up to be an automatic machine gun. It just doesn't make any sense that these are still out and available and we act as if this is just okay, because it's not. Well, I think, let I would definitely like to talk about that as well, because that, that when we come off mass shootings, that is a lot of yeah. the way until mm -hmm. like, the next one. So I think it's inevitable that coming off and like this examine people's minds. So on that too okay I yeah know we're good to go and i'll just okay. lean in and to talk a little bit. sorry if it looks a little awkward just to make okay so if first of all if i could if you could take me back to just yesterday when you first heard the news that this was going on what were you thinking about the situation shannon well obviously i had a lot of concern for the former president's uh, physical safety. I had a lot of concern um, as the news started developing about who in the crowd might have been injured. And unfortunately, as we know, um, there was a um, retired uh, fire chief who shielded his family and unfortunately was killed. We know the two others were uh, seriously injured. Um, but it it takes your breath away when you think about something like this happening at a political rally. Um, Obviously, there's going to be a lot of discussion that happens about what the Secret Service did or didn't do um, to secure the footprint around um, the stage where the former president was uh, slated to speak. Um, all in early reports are that the building was um, unguarded, at least on the rooftop. It was very close to the stage. That seems incredible to me as somebody who um, thought a lot about this as a law enforcement officer, thought about a lot about this as, as a mayor, um, and worrying about big scale public events and making sure that everything was locked down in light of what we've seen on a number of different instances, um, not the least of which was the Las Vegas shooter. So there's a lot of questions that have to be answered. But first and foremost, it hurts your heart as a human being um, that anyone was injured, much less killed, in an act so American, which is coming to a political rally to hear from a candidate. And you were talking about your background, and we have the DDD here in just a matter of weeks. <clears throat> uh, for your part, when, when you talk about law enforcement and as the mayor, when you plan land folks like this, there's so many involved but can you take us through in, in your experience mm -hmm. like to try to put together a safe rally well you want to uh, obviously understand any known threats um certainly you want to be talking to uh the fbi joint terrorism task force i'm um, heading into any kind of a local event uh, of this nature and we had many of them um particularly throughout the summer uh, in Grant Park and elsewhere, uh, you want to make sure that law enforcement is totally uh, coordinated, that they're coordinated uh, with any of the buildings nearby. Um, for example, after the Las Vegas shooting, we went through a real protocol to look at uh, the various hotels that uh, bordered the Grant Park area, the high-rise buildings on the northern side in particular, thinking about um, drones that could potentially carry weapons uh, that could be launched. Uh, from the lake. Um, you want to go through all of those things. Certainly, you want to run at least one, if not 
multiple tabletop exercises leading into that. You've got to make sure that the perimeter um, is locked down, that there's a command post uh, nearby. You want to make sure that you um, are coordinating, frankly, with nearby hospitals and ambulances in the event of any kind of mass casualty. So there's a lot that goes into planning these kinds of events um, when you're talking about a high profile event and, and a lot of the activity uh, take pla taking place outside. Rallies, campaign rallies, that it, it's hard to get more American that because we are a democracy. We get, and right now though, we are in a climate where there is a lot of animosity, um, um, a attack, verbal attacks. We have, uh, given that, is this something that you thought was even a possible scenario? Well, unfortunately, yes. Look at January 6th. That's probably the most notable um, act of political insurrection that we've had um, in recent memory. But when you combine the, the, the soaring rhetoric that is baked in violence um, and demonizing people who have different political views, and then you add to that toxic mix, um, a number of people who become followers on the fringe that um, are um, disconnected from the normal um, society that may have mental illness and then a ready access to firearms. It's horrible to think about this as a possibility, but you have to think about this as a possibility. And unfortunately, yesterday's tragic, tragic events was a reminder of why you have to prepare in these kind of circumstances for the worst case scenario. But what I hope comes out of this, um, given that we've got the Republican convention starting here um, tomorrow, we've got then the DNC following a few weeks thereafter, I hope uh, the two candidates, uh, President Biden and former President Trump, come together and de-escalate the violent rhetoric that is out there and tell their followers, tell Americans that there is no place for this kind of violence. We've heard that yesterday, certainly President Biden um, said that, but I think there's gotta be a joint, what I'd love to see is a joint statement by both denouncing violence, um, denouncing these kinds of acts. And you know, people are calling it political violence, it's violence, pure and simple. And we cannot normalize it we cannot politicize it. Unfortunately, I saw over the last 24 hours, there are some people who are saying it's this party's fault or that party's fault. No, that that's not helpful, constructive. And frankly, it's wrong. No one has clean hands here. There's a lot more that could be done by all sides. But going forward, we have to come together in a real spirit of being Americans. Well, you talk about um, going forward with the DNC and R and R and the the thought: could there be copycats or could there be another lone wolf? Are are those things that are in your mind? I know you will be at the DNC and being um, still in those circles. Is yeah. something that you that you think possible possibility? Look, I think that um, a couple of things um, that are, I think important to remember. Number one. Um, the Secret Service, the FBI, the Chicago Police Department have been planning for worst case scenarios for quite some time. It, it doesn't, didn't start last night or today. Um, I think they've got to refresh and relook at and reevaluate um, their safety plans in light of um, what we saw happen yesterday. But I am hopeful and I believe that the safety planning and the what, what if scenarios um, have been um, thought about for quite some time. So that's number one. I think that the um, DNC itself, um, I'd love to see a communication from the party chair to the state parties um, talking about um, what additional steps they're going to be taking to make sure that people are safe um, in their hotels, at McCormick Place, at the United Center, in transit, um, to and from. I think that will go a long way. I've seen um, conversations today amongst mayors all across the country, there's fear out there. And I understand that. So I think the party leadership has to step up in this moment and reassure delegates that are coming from all across the country 
that there's a plan to make sure that everyone is able to enjoy um, the uh, convention, to go about the party business, but do it in an atmosphere where an environment where their safety is going to be paramount. You were talking earlier about how you hope for a joint statement. Um, the, we know President Biden said he actually actually did speak to yes you know, a small step, but we also were hearing that uh, they were positive campaign some of that that right inside. Uh, what do you think needs to happen apart from a message coming from? I say this because when you were mentioning like local and regional party groups, how is that going to trickle? Unfortunately, there's been so much buildup and animosity on both sides mm -hmm. uh, uh, on the ground to hear it from someone other than just the president. Yeah. Well, look, there's nothing wrong with a hotly contested election. Well, where the line gets crossed is when the leadership, the spokespeople, the surrogates talk in terms of violence. There can't be any tolerance for that. And, and I think we've got to come together as a country and, and say clearly that's, there's no place for that kind of rhetoric here because the rhetoric can lead to action, unfortunately. And it invites um, people who are unstable and invites people um, who have uh, a grudge or some kind of other grievance um, to take it to the next level with violence. And I think going forward, because the campaigns, of course, will resume. But going forward, there has to be a clear and unequivocal statement that they are denouncing violence. Look, I'm not a politically naive person by any stretch of the imagination, but wouldn't it be great if going into the Republican convention, there was a statement, um, not just denouncing uh, the violence, but a statement uh, around um, the need to get rid of assault weapons. I think it's unlikely that that's going to happen, but I sure hope the Democratic Party will make sure that assault weapons ban is front and center and that some concrete actions are taken to make that a reality. Well, Mayor, is there anything else about this, given your background, mm -hmm. that you think, think that we to know that mm -hmm. your experience, it gives you a unique perspective on what's going on right now? Mm -hmm. Well, what I think is going to be important is for um, a thorough investigation of what happened, because clearly there was a security breach of some sort. I hope that the House in particular doesn't seek to politicize this, but I do think that there's got to be a full accounting. I think there's got to be an independent investigation of what happened um, and why it was we're hearing very early reports that maybe the Secret Service wasn't fully staffed to cover this event, um, that they were relying upon local law enforcement. But that building was um, vulnerable. And that um, young man, now dead, um, the shooter, was able to get up there with an assault weapon and shoot into a crowd, um, certainly towards the former president, but killing and wounding um, people who were just there to exercise their rights um, as members of a democracy. We need to know how that was possible and what needs to be done to ensure that nothing like this again can occur. I had one follow-up to that. Um, and before I do, I think we need to know. Um, what I was thinking is that, you know, uh, the public figure yourself, but given when we had the protests here in 2020 and, and uh, those spilling into the neighborhood were yeah. a place where, uh, you know, very high profile, big crowds. Um, experience. And if there has been any sort of incident where you felt that, you know, your city was at risk. Well, <clears throat> The answer is yes, but I'm I'm reluctant to talk about it because uh, those matters are under investigation. Uh, but what I will say is this: peaceful protest is a part of our democracy. But what you worry about is what we saw in the summer of 2020: peaceful protests get hijacked by 
um, people who came to do harm, people who wanted to um, get into literally a fight with the police and videotape it and make it go viral. And that was happening, not just in Chicago, but it was happening simultaneously all over the country. And you worry about that happening. You worry about certainly and wonder, and I still do, who was that? Because those folks were very sophisticated in their methods and means. They were not your garden variety anarchist. Um, this was something different. And we still don't have an answer. Um, I talked to my fellow mayors from that time with some frequency, and this is one of the things that comes up with some frequency. Who are those people? And why have they not been identified and brought to justice? My hope is that as we see crowds converge on Chicago, um, coming to uh, the DNC, that we have learned the lessons of 2020 in a host of different ways, but not the least of which is to be on a lookout for people who are not just there to express their political views or opposition to that or support for something else, but are there for a much more nefarious person and that we act quickly to identify them and pull them literally out of the crowd and that our criminal justice system here in Cook County in particular, um, but also the federal uh, system is, is ready and willing to act. This is what we must do to assure people that we take their safety seriously. It's not an infringement on somebody's First Amendment rights. When you come and you're acting in a violent way, you come with tools of violence. I've been in many protests and marches in my lifetime. I never came with a bat, a tire arm, fire uh, works, um, or worse. And we saw a lot of that in the summer of 2020, and we've got to be on the lookout for it now. So we've got to make sure the protests can happen in a peaceful way, safeguard people's First Amendment rights. Um, but when they cross the line, there has to be swift action.